welcome to I Could Murder a Podcast. We are back once again, and I'm joined by, of course I am, the kooky, the klutzy, the king size, Kafka esque Ben Carter. King size. Fantastic. King size. Fantastic. Yeah, but yeah, kooky yeah. is, you know, so you got to roll with the punch. How are we doing? Are you okay? <laughs> I'm very well. About you? Yeah, doing okay. Doing okay. King size. No, that hasn't got me. Hasn't got me. Uh, yeah, glad to hear you doing well, though. Glad to hear you doing well. We're back with another episode, a fascinating episode, a varied episode, and thrilled to be in the company of producer Dan. Hello. <laughs> Repping your uh, swampy cock today, Ben. Swampy Are you really? really? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I just misheard. Swampy cup, you said. Swampy cock. Yeah, okay. Oh. Isn't that what you, they talk about, this little thing here? Yeah, that little thing, yeah. It's a foot. You were talking about shedding skin earlier, Ben. I think that was you. <laughs> no, I think it was Dan, but about you. Dusty old boy. <laughs> Maybe you've got no dust in your house. Do you not That's shed your not skin? True. That's not true. <laughs> oh, he shed skin, boy. <laughs> oh, yes. Don't you worry about that. Mm. Yeah, this is this is a very intriguing one. I realise, Ben, you're a cryptic clue. Do you want to remind us what that was? Uh, it's going to annoy people. I know that much. It was... Um, <laughs> Sorry, they're not very memorable, um, which is a problem. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, I got it. it's actually quite good. Chelsea should lock up that scientist. Stanford <laughs> yes. will annoy people. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. I, cause I just, because I didn't know much about the case before you did the teaser, and I was like, oh, that works so well. Really good. That's sort of Stanford. And yeah. I was like, okay. That's, yeah. yeah. I was going to do an office thing, Stan you know, but. Yes, yeah, so you win some and you lose some with the cryptic clues. Uh, that one's sort of a, 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 a draw. Yeah, okay, I'll give, you, I'll give you that. But anyway, we hope everyone enjoyed last week's episode to Enfield Haunting, something a little bit different. Yeah, we're very intrigued to see what you guys thought about it and if you believed it or, or if you thought it was all just a, as Ben put it, was it just a few naughty girls doing naughty things in the bedroom. So we're very interested to see what you thought about that. Today's episode, again, it is kind of not really our usual, but we are, this, this series is very much... Rogue. It is Rogue, yeah. It's like a DJ remix in our series. It's, um, what's it? Skill Rex. Scrap, Skirax, Skillrix, Skrillex. Yeah, yeah, that's what I said first time. Skrillex. <laughs> Sorry, Skrillex. Yeah, it's like you're giving Skrillex a uh, back care log, basically. Yeah, I mean, just like last week, is a very different case by our standards, um, but definitely one that a lot of people have mentioned over the years that they'd like to see us covered, and also one that uh, we've been equally fascinated by. The only case I can think we've covered that's even close to being similar was that one a couple of months ago on the website, the Holmesburg prison experiments, but that was dark and disturbing on a completely different scale. Yeah, um, that was. Yeah, uh, it's fascinating this one and uh, I'm excited to see kind of uh, our opinions on the case towards the end as well because I keep imagining ourselves in this scenario now and in everything I thought of, I am the prisoner, which is, yeah, different outcomes. We'll get into that because I, I do. There's something I do want to pose to us as a group later on. I immediately know who Danny is. I immediately know who Ben is. I'm not sure where I am. Yeah, actually, I agree with you. Sorry, Dan. Is that bad news for me? Or? No, no, it's a compliment. It's a compliment. Mm. Good leadership. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Leadership and cruelty. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> like we always do, uh, Danny is going to set the scene on this week's case. The Stanford Prison Experiment, conducted by psychologist Dr. Philip Zimbardo in 1971, is shrouded in horrific controversies that continue to disturb its participants to date. Intended to examine the psychological effects of perceived power, the experiment involved college students assigned to play roles as guards and prisoners in a simulated prison environment. However, after less than 24 hours, the study quickly spiralled out of control, as those designated as guards began exhibiting abusive and sadistic behaviours towards their fellow participants, whilst the simulated prisoners experienced extreme emotional distress and disorientation. The controversies surrounding the Stanford Prison Experiment have raised profound ethical concerns, including issues of informed consent, psychological harm, and the blurred line between research and abuse, casting a shadow over the validity and ethics of the study's eventual findings. So this is, of course, the Stanford Prison Experiment, also known as the case of Dr. Zimbardo, the brutalities at Stanford County Jail, and the Stanford Prison Controversies. Not a lot of titles this week. Uh, really stretch that one out. The Embargo of Dr. Zimbardo. Very good. I'd watch that. Yeah. But he's been banned to say anything because of the embargo. So it's really just him sitting there for an hour and a half, not doing a lot, a little bit anxious. 
Um, but anyway, uh, after what he put people through, which we'll get into <laughs> just now, actually, he deserves it. As always, a quote to start us off. The Stanford Prison Experiment exposed the flaws in our justice system, as well as our own psychological makeup, shedding light on the innate human desire for power and control. The study revealed the dark depths of human nature and the potential for evil that exists within us all. If you put good apples into a bad situation, you get bad apples. Yeah, so it's an interesting one, isn't it? Uh, obviously, we're going to discuss this further about the putting good apples in a bad situation. But I sometimes think if you put a good apple into a bad situation, you can make the good apple thrive. Oh, really? Yeah. How's that? How's that? Well, if you put someone in a situation where bad things are happening around them and they stood up for the good. Sorry, I was literally thinking of literal apples. apples. Okay, yeah, well, okay, well, <laughs> uh, let's think of something quite... Uh, a barrel of bad apples, a good apple at the top. It's just going to look look delicious and uh, be more appealing. So I don't think that's going to... But eventually rots. Yeah, event, ev- so is everything, though. <laughs> yeah. We're going to go into a bit of background in terms of exactly how the experiment came to be before going into a timeline of events of the experiment and having a wider look at the impact that this incident had. The Stanford Prison Experiment was one of the brainchilds, uh, or brain children, I don't know the technical one there when there's, there's more than one, of Dr. Philip George Zimbardo. So Dr. Zimbardo has a very interesting story both prior to and after the Stanford experiment. And actually, I know we sort of had a little jibe at him in the intro there, but he uh, he's still very active. And the last thing on his Twitter page, or X, was him going at a podcast that covered the, uh, that covered the case. So yeah, well, if you're here, cheers. Bring it on, Zimbardo. Absolutely. Charity fight, Ben against Zimbardo. Love to see it. Let us know. It's about 90 below. odd. It's about 90 odd. Yeah, it gives you a fucking Probably. chance. <laughs> Take it. So Philip was born on the 23rd of March 1933 in the South Bronx, New York City. Both his mother and father, Margaret Bishia and Giorgio Zimbardo, were Italian immigrants originally from Camerata, Sicily, and the pair went on to have four children shortly after arriving in America. Three boys and one girl. Oh, three one. Oh, I was waiting for that. We had to film the morning after as well, didn't we? Bloody Nora. Don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, cheers. Have a good one. I literally don't know what you're talking about. Do you want to elaborate? Football. It's all hair and it's all football. Always. Yeah, football. Yeah, football. Uh, Newcastle won 3 1. Against my nice. team. Got it. Yeah, fun. One of the lads. Yeah. <laughs> The Zimbardo children, made up of Philip, George Jr., Donald and Vera, faced a great deal of discrimination and challenges whilst growing up in New York during the 30s and 40s. According to Philip, he and his siblings were regularly racially prejudiced by both adults and other children in the area, and they were also made fun of for living in one of the poorer neighbourhoods in the Bronx. Philip went on record later in life to say that he and his family were regularly mistakenly abused for being Puerto Rican, Jewish, Mexican or black, but that they would also be abused for being Italian-American. He would claim that it was these experiences that would spark his curiosity in people and subsequently encourage him to explore psychology in his education. So as we mentioned, the Zimbardo family lived in one of the poorer parts of town. They lived in a small shared apartment on what was predominantly an Italian-American street. The family were receiving state welfare with Philip's father, George Sr., working as an electrician whilst his mother helped to raise the family. At school, despite the challenges he faced outside of it, Philip was said to be an excellent student who was passionate about learning and curious about everything. He attended James Monroe High School in the Bronx before going on to Brooklyn College, where he studied psychology, sociology, and anthropology, earning a triple major upon graduating with a, and this is the first time we've heard this on the show, a summer cum lord. Lord spell L. A U D, come Lord. But the rest felt like you'd imagine it. Yeah, that's your um, (laughs) PlayStation Gamer tag, isn't it? Come Lord? Yeah, Gamer tag. No, Summer. Summer Ben. Summer Ben. Have some of that. Summer Come Lord. No. Have Summer (laughs) Kama. Which is basically Latin for with highest praise and honor and stinky. He got a triple major with highest praise. Some more information on the cum lord, not You're from, expert, from the cum lord. Um, I did do a little search. <laughs> I did do a little search for us. So cum lord basically means uh, with distinction. Also, this isn't going to be another Viscount moment, is it? Cum loud. Cum lord. We are <laughs> looking at how to pronounce these phrase from Latin. These title. We'll be looking at how to say more Latin useful edu- education related vocabulary too. So stay tuned to the channel. Loads to learn here. Cum laude. Cum laude. Cum laude. It's how it's yes. said. 
Okay. So, okay. So just, sorry, yeah. we, you've just heard there. We've actually, just to double check, we didn't say it wrong. It's not come, come Lord. It's come laude. Come laude. Come laude. Come laude. Come, come laude. Which, come uh, laude. <laughs> come, sorry. The uh, music makes that, yeah. Yeah. Well, come laude uh, basically means with distinction and that typically goes to sort of 16 to 35 percent of the class magda cum laude which basically means with great distinction typically goes to the top six to 15 percent of the class and summer cum laude uh, not summer cum lord basically means with highest praise or honor and that typically goes to the top one to five percent of class so yeah uh, zimbardo he was he was really good Another note worth mentioning about his school life. Uh, so whilst uh, Zimbardo was over at James Monroe High School, he actually shared a number of classes with and apparently sat next to Stanley Milgram, uh, which is the, the odds you would have got on that are, are incredible. Stanley would go on to create and conduct the very famous and highly controversial Milgram experiment in 1961, which is a whole nother case in itself. <laughs> Ooh, hold, hold up. up. It's, it's time. time. Is that right? Me to do the effect? Was it too delay? That's fine. <laughs> he loves it. Yes, yes, yes. We are back once again for Tommy's trivia. Welcome back. And hopefully, this is a, a terrific one. Yes. Whilst doing the research for this case, um, I am um, come loudly come across um, this Milgram experiment, uh, which Ben has just so delicately thrown my way. It's one that, uh, looking into it and seeing some research for it online, I thought that this is fascinating. I think Dan's going to be very. Uh, fascinated by it as well obviously ben you already know what it is but i thought that for the listeners and the viewers they deserve to know what milgram did and i'd be interested to see if they approve of this experiment as well on august the 7th 1961 at yale university stanley milgram's study was all about seeing how much people would listen to authority figures even when it meant doing something they felt was wrong so participants were asked to give what they thought were painful electric shocks to someone they couldn't see if they got questions wrong so basically they've got a microphone They've got this little uh, thing to turn the dial up on, this elect on the electric shocks and there's someone behind the screen they can't see, which basically they ask them these questions, they get it wrong, hit the shock. If they get it wrong again, go a high voltage, hit the shock. So that's the situation we're in. So the people who were doing the experiment were told they were helping with a memory and learning study. They thought they were administrating shocks to a person, but it actually was an actor and the shocks weren't real. So, but they didn't, you know, obviously they had no idea they thought it was real. Even though the person receiving the shocks acted like they were in pain, participants were told to keep going by the person running the experiment and increasing the voltage. From the one person I saw doing it, he could, he could noticeably see him feeling uncomfortable looking around, but the guy leading the experiment was basically going, no, nope, keep going, it's fine, keep going. And then he just would reluctantly go, okay, and just and just keep, keep on going. Surprisingly, a lot of people would persist with it. Many participants were visibly uncomfortable and stressed out during the experiment, and people administrating the shocks even went to dangerous voltages after being reassured by their scientist. The one I saw, he went to about 120 volts, and the guy was like, you could hear the actor going, ah, ah, it really hurts, like I'm going to leave. He says he's not happy, should, should we stop? He's like, no, keep going. But the guy persisted going to well over 350 volts with the same guy. So he knew he was in pain then, but he still kept going all the way up to there. And that's obviously 350 volts is, is extremely dangerous as well. And uh, <laughs> I thought this was slightly unnecessary by the actors and stuff. Uh, they administrate, administrated that one. The actor didn't make any sound. <laughs> so it was as if they gone, yeah, pretend you're dead. <laughs> just to kind of trick him. So it was just basically Milgram wanted to understand why people would do things they know are wrong just because someone in charge tells them to and they'd go on to reference things like concentration camps like how can prison guards or concentration camp guards do that when they know what they're doing is so horrible and so wrong is it just because they're told what to do and they kind of diminish, diminish responsibility and it's still one of the most famous psychological experiments ever done and has been redone many times over the world it's very yeah it's very interesting when someone says no someone with a clipboard and a white coat says no nah, you're right <laughs> yeah. Okay. But yes, Dan, what do you think about that? Well, I was just looking. Do you know how many volts it takes to kill a man? I don't actually. Apparently, it's as little as 50 volts. Oh, wow. Mm. I guess it depends how, what scary. state the person's in. I don't mean yeah, which so. American state. Washington is worse than <laughs> Alabama. I mean, what you know, you know, the body. But, but very interesting, yeah. It's crazy how people can push it so high, but just being told to do it. Mm. Weird. But you, yeah, you're going to learn all more about that. Sorry, Ben, for interrupting you here, but oh, of course. <laughs> Back to the case. So yeah, very interesting coincidence that Philip and Stanley were classmates. And um, yeah, Stanley's experiments would come 10 years before uh, the Stanford prison experiments. 
After graduating from Brooklyn College in 1954, Zimbardo studied psychology at Yale University for the following five years, where he earned his master's degree and PhD in the process. Whilst at Yale, he also began dating fellow student Rose Abdelnour, with the pair later getting married and having a son together, whom they named Adam. After earning his PhD in 1959, Zimbardo began teaching for a year at Yale before going on to become a professor of psychology at NYU and also teaching for a brief period at Columbia University. From what I understand, these are all quite highly regarded universities, like top level universities. He held his role at NYU through to 1968, where he then joined the faculty at Stanford University, and he became their professor of psychology just three years later in 1971. During this time, his research interests focused on social psychology, time perspective, and the psychological effects of de-individualization. So individualization is defined as a phenomenon in which individuals in a group setting believe they cannot be identified under the cover of the crowd, which reduces the accountability and results in non-normative behavior. I fought in a lift. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Or um, what was the other one we did that was kind of, no, not really similar actually at all, but I've brought it up now, the, the bystander effect. That's uh, different, yeah. isn't it? Where there's a crowd, but... You assume you someone don't... else is going to interject. Exactly, yeah. A lot of, lot of different things in the world, aren't there? <laughs> there really are, Ben. <laughs> you kooky king-sized bastard, go on. Thank you. Further exploring these interests, Zimbardo would attend various research seminars, including those led by his former mentor, Neil Elgar Miller. And it's believed it was during this particular period that Zimbardo wanted to explore social experiments regarding aggression in humans. Ideas for my first experiments in human aggression came from discussions we had in a research seminar about William Golding's Lord of the Flies. Good book? Never read it. I've never read it. Oh. oh. Never Great read it, book, yeah. then. Read read it. It. It's definitely on there for me. Definitely. Mm. On the list. On the list, yeah. Mm, big old list you got there, boy. Mm. We all like to believe that the line between good and evil is a wall. The people who do terrible things, such as commit murder, treason, or kidnapping, are on the evil side of this line, and the rest of us could never cross it. But the line between good and evil is permeable. Some people are on the good side only because situations have never coerced or seduced them to cross over. So essentially, Zimbardo was suggesting that, much like what happened in Lord of the Flies, without supervision or guidance, certain situations can cause good people to engage in evil acts, or that any person who, when placed in the right set of circumstances, is capable of evil behaviour. This has also been compared in multiple ways to dynamics and behaviours of members of the Nazi party. Though Zimbardo didn't define evil as within the actual act of wrongdoing, but rather as the exercise of power in order to psychologically or physically harm another human being. He went on to say the following at a conference in Toronto. I had been conducting research for some years on de-individuation, vandalism and dehumanisation that illustrated the ease with which ordinary people could be led to engage in antisocial acts by putting them in situations where they felt anonymous or they could perceive of others in ways that made them less than human as enemies or objects. Zimbardo likes long sentences, doesn't he? Mm. Not just for his prisoners. <laughs> Am I right? Is that okay? <laughs> you fucking brilliant. Cheers. That is yeah. so class. Clever. That could be the best thing that you've said. Ever. Ever, well. ever yeah. Wow. Cum Nine. laude. <laughs> <laughs> it's the music, isn't it? That makes it so It's so nice. On the top of discussions surrounding the Lord of the Flies, there was also a large rise in brutalities caused by prison guards on inmates across America during the late 60s and early 70s. This was something that Zabada became extremely curious about and wanted to understand the possible factors at play. This together with a generous government grant from the US Office of Naval Research in order to understand antisocial behaviour resulted in Zimbardo putting forward his proposal for SPE, which we all know as the Stanford Prison Experiment. His proposal was soon after approved by university officials with the official website of SPE describing the study's goal as follows. We wanted to see what the psychological effects were of becoming a prisoner or prison guard. To do this, we decided to set up a simulator prison and then carefully note the effects of this institution on the behaviour of all those within its walls. In his proposal of the Stanford Prison Experiment, Zimbardo stated that he aimed to investigate the psychological effects of perceived power and authority within a simulated prison environment. The experiment was designed to last for a period of two weeks and it involved randomly assigned college students to play the roles of guards and prisoners in a makeshift prison that was set up in the basement of the Stanford Psychology Building. 
So we're going to do a little bit of a breakdown in terms of the prep before moving into our timeline. So first of all, the prisoners and the guards. So to conduct his study, as Tom said, uh, Zimbardo needed willing participants to play both the prisoners and the prison guards. He therefore took out an ad in the Help Wanted section in the first week of August 1971 editions of two different local newspapers, the Paulo Alto Times and the Stamford Daily. And the adverts stated the following. Male college students needed the psychological study of prison life. $15 per day for one to two weeks beginning August 14th. For further information and applications, come to room 248, Jordan Hall, Stanford U. So yeah, first of all, on the advert itself, so $15 back in 1971 equates to roughly $114 in 2024. Oh, so shit. Not a bad bit of moolah, especially when we go into what the applicants were kind of hoping for in this study. If you had two weeks... Like that you know for just in your head you're probably thinking sitting around doing not a great deal yeah well that's it so i mean the majority of the people will go on to it with the interview process when they were asked if they'd rather be a guard or a prisoner the vast majority said oh no one likes guards prisoners don't have to do anything we i'd rather be a prisoner so they're thinking maybe they'll sit in a cage for two weeks and get you know a, a decent amount of money in return there was some i went and down a bit of a rabbit hole especially with the i was saying to the boys the official stanford prison experiment website you guys need to leave rabbits alone i don't know why you keep going down them <laughs> where are they <laughs> peter peter i like your little jacket cum laude <laughs> Deary me. Uh, but there, yeah, there's a bit of controversy about these specific ads because there are photos of the actual ad and people criticise the way that it's worded and the use of the term prison life because uh, some people feel that the use of that term, including fellow psychologists and authors, um, suggests that those specific words together or the fact that it was exploring prisons would have been more likely to attract volunteers who perhaps had more aggressive traits, narcissism, Machiavellianism, social dominance orientation and lower levels of empathy. So yeah, people have said they should have just put psychological study and not reference the prison life because that attracted a certain demographic. Yeah, Two individuals, Thomas Carnahan and Sam McFarland, were the ones that really were pushing this to say that. But I, I don't know. I think it was the financial thing that probably mm. caught people's eyes more than the prison Money life. Money talks, Ben. It absolutely does. It absolutely does. So yeah, from these adverts, 75 male students initially applied to take part in the study. These 75 who responded were interviewed concerning their mental health history, any kind of family history of psychopathy, and any past antisocial behaviours. This particular number of 75 was whittled down very quickly to 24, perhaps due to the intentional exclusion of anybody with a criminal background, medical or mental health condition. The 24 selected to take part were, quote, judged to be the most stable, both physically and mentally, the most mature and the least involved in antisocial behaviour. So they, there's a lot of criticisms about the study itself. In these interview processes and the application process, they were very keen to whittle this number down to the exact uh, demographic that they wanted for this study. Each applicant was then put through a series of additional interviews and thorough mental health screenings as well as multiple psychological tests in order to deem them both stable and suitable before the experiment was officially due to begin. And one of the screening questions was literally a multiple choice, have you ever taken marijuana, uppers, downers, heroin or crack cocaine? And from the images you can find online, a lot of these boxes are ticked. So just a day before the experiment was due to start, the candidates were divided into two 12-man teams, nine guards plus three substitute guards, and nine prisoners plus three substitute prisoners, with all the prisoners agreeing to spend the following seven to 14 days living within the basement. Conditions and responsibilities were obviously vastly different for each team, with prisoners having to remain confined for the duration, being made to stay in their small, shared cells all day and night with the exception of limited access to the yard, which was a small communal corridor area within the basement. Dr. Zimbardo recalled. These kids were all anti-war activists, hippies with long hair. They were against authority. Nobody wanted to be a guard. As we mentioned in the application process, when they were asked, would you rather be a guard? Would you rather be a prisoner? All of them were kind of inclined to say, rather be a prisoner. Less work, um, the money's good, and nobody likes guards was kind of the general consensus there. So obviously with foresight, you might now, well, it, it, it depends where you stand, but it, yeah, they assumed that it would be a lot easier uh, to be the prisoners in this situation. We'll see where this goes because it would not go as easy as they perhaps expected. 
so some people have said that in this kind of de deciding which people made guards and which people made prisoners, some people have said that they literally flipped a coin to do this, but uh, other people suggest that Zimbardo was very uh, controlled in his approach and was based on the interviews, wanted certain people that he'd met straight away. He identified that person's a guard, that person's a prisoner, or would, based on some of their answers, would say, oh, actually, let's put him in this situation and see how he fares. So yeah, there's a lot of contention around that particular situation. So the prisoners didn't have a lot of room to move, they didn't have a lot of space, and they didn't have a lot of independence. The guards, meanwhile, were given access to additional rest, recreation, and relaxation rooms, uh, which were kept separate from the prisoners, whilst also being able to work in teams of three, with each team being able to complete an eight-hour shift before being able to leave the basement and go home after each stint. So that was, yeah, an immediate difference. The prisoners are there 24-7, the guards do eight-hour shifts each day and then go home. Dr. Zimbardo also played a role within the experiment, making himself the prison superintendent and one of his understudies, David Jaff, the prison warden. And yeah, we'll go into this because Zimbardo very much fell into this role and it kind of, well, he very much became immersed in this role. The applicants playing the guards attended an orientation where they were given military uniforms to wear, complete with silver mirrored aviator style sunglasses, which apparently were given to them to create a sense of anonymity and also to prevent direct eye contact with prisoners. They were also given wooden batons, known as billy clubs, uh, which apparently um, Zimbardo was able to borrow from local police, and they were also given whistles. The guards were instructed to refer to the prisoners by their prison numbers only, and not to use their names. They were told that if any prisoners escaped, then the study would immediately be over. And they were also informed that they could not cause any kind of physical harm to the prisoners, and it's alleged that they were also said that you can't withhold food from them, but we'll, we'll see where that goes but that they also did need to maintain law and order in the prison and they needed to make the prisoners feel like they were in an actual prison. Zimbardo recalled the following in an interview with the BBC. All the guards wore military uniforms and we had them wear these silver reflecting sunglasses. And what it does is you can't see someone's eyes and so that loses some of their humanness, their humanity. In general, we wanted to create a sense of power that is, the guards, as a category, are people who have power over others. In this case, power over the prisoners. We were, of course, studying not only the prisoners, but also the guards, who found themselves in a new power-laden role. Many researchers of the experiment and other academics in the field of psychology believe that having gone through this kind of induction instruction with the participants playing the guards would have resulted in them performing demand characteristics, meaning the individuals will have been more likely to behave in a way which they felt the researchers expected them to behave and to also act in very exaggerated, stereotypical ways that mirrored the way they believed authentic prison guards to behave. These stereotypes are predominantly negative and highly aggressive. Other critics of the experiment believe that those playing the guards were specifically encouraged to act aggressively towards the prisoners. The doubters and kind of naysayers on this whole experience are basically saying Zimbardo muddied his whole experience, his whole experiment before they even were in the cells. So by allowing him to have the chat beforehand and being involved within himself, he's basically said to the guys, "This is how I want you to behave." So yeah, the findings aren't anything that you can take. So yeah, he's he's kind of fucked it before he started, which I think is. Fair. Uh, the other crit criticism that would go on to be said is this thing called the independent variable, which essentially, like if someone is, if you if you're trying medicine or whatever, you'd be giving one person the medicine, one person not the medicine to see the different effects it has on the body or certain diets. One person will have will take this food, one person won't take that food, and you'll see how it affects the two people. Whereas this is an experiment where basically he's muddied the minds of the prison guards in this one, where he should have done the exactly same experiment without muddying the minds and seeing how the people reacted but he hadn't done that, so how can you take the findings to know this is how everyone will behave, is the one of the big criticisms about this. Absolutely, absolutely. And the, yeah, but there'll be a few more that we'll jump into as we go into our timeline. So we now have our prisoners, we now have our guards. Let's talk a little bit about the prison itself. So the small mock prison, which would play home to the experiment, was also put together just a day before the study was due to start. So a lot of last minute stuff here. Lastminute.com. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Thank you for this week's sponsor. I'm actually quite confused. Com. <laughs> Last minute prisons. Um, Cumlaudi.com. Oh. oh, that could be. But yeah, this was put Come together in the. Laude. So the prison was constructed within the basement of Building 420, known as Jordan Hall, which was Stanford's psychology block. The converted basement had an 11 metre, 35 foot area segmented off for the experiment, which included the yard corridor, as well as three separate three-person cells that were formerly laboratory rooms. 
which measured at only two meters by three meters. So Zimbardo uh, had an idea, basically trying to make things a bit more authentic. He brought in a prison consultant who was Carlo Prescott and put him as head of the parole board. And he had actually been a prisoner servant at San Quentin. Um, so he had recently been released and Zimbardo thought it'd be a good idea to get him brought in to basically, they brought him in to essentially make sure that things would be done in the same way that would have been done in prison. The lab doors were then replaced with prison doors and within each cell there was nothing but three individual beds, each with a single sheet and pillow, allowing little to no room to move once you were in the cell. There was also a small, dark, two foot by two foot storage cupboard that were converted into a lockable solitary confinement cell, so not a lot of room in there. So that was like a, what they call it, the, the hole, they called it the hole within the experiment, so it's uh, essentially isolation. Or you just imagine the chokey, but less spiky. The chokey! You'll be naughtier than the chokey. Like that, Dan? Just like that, please. Thanks so much indeed. It had no natural light in there or fresh air for the prisoners. As well as this, intercom systems were installed and small holes were created in partition walls in order to observe the prisoners, whilst their cells were also bugged so that researchers could secretly hear what the prisoners were saying. Mm, very intriguing. So during the orientation meetings with the guards, Zimbardo can be seen and heard on record saying the following about the participants playing the prisoners. You can create a sense of fear in them. You can create a notion that their life is totally controlled by us and that there will be constant surveillance. We have total power in the situation and they have none. So we have our guards, we have our prisoners, we have our rules and we have our prison. We have all the ingredients now to make one of the most notorious experiments in the history of psychology. And it's here that we move over to the timeline of the Stanford Prison Experiment. Dear one in the Big Brother house. Oh, I don't like it here. Can I get out? Actually, I had enough for this prison cell. No, you're not allowed. Oh, don't Two don't weeks, be please. Like $115 that. in 2024 money. Time lapse. Oh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a better man for it. Day one, Sunday, August 15th, 1971. During what was described as a quiet summer Sunday across the state of California, several police cars began to tear through the city of Palo Alto with their sirens blazing. They made... Actually, pretty, Fucking that's pretty good. Brilliant. That's pretty good. Oh, we, need, we need several, though. Just okay. That's a good use of it, Tom. Brilliant. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Brilliant. They made 12 concurrent arrests that morning, picking up all of the participants that had been selected as prisoners from their home addresses or from different locations around town. They handcuffed each man whilst searching them and reading them their legal rights before placing each man in the back of their car and taking them to Palo Alto Police Headquarters. Once they arrived at the station, they were charged with burglary and armed robbery before being fingerprinted, booked and having their mugshots taken. Each individual was then taken to a holding cell where he was left blindfolded to ponder his fate and wonder exactly what he had done to get himself into this mess. So yeah, there's, there's a lot going on with this particular moment itself. So when they were picked up, they were all blindfolded and placed into the back of a legitimate police car by a legitimate police officer. Everything here was authentic to simulate the uh, a, a genuine arrest, um, and all of the yeah, individuals involved were legitimate. The booking process was real, and all of this was done at Zimbardo's request. So as well as this, as the prisoner participants were not aware that this was going to happen, although in, in a video where Zimbardo is briefing the guards, he says this is going to happen and that they're aware of it. So it depends who you believe here. They say that they were not aware of it, but he says to the guards that this is going to happen and they are aware of it. But Zimbardo, some of the things he says, you can take with a pinch of salt. He's quite slippery, Ben. He is quite slippery. Slippery Zimbardo. It sounds a bit like a fish. Yeah, because um, the, uh, the river the other day got a couple of Zimbardos. <laughs> I drink an extra of a couple of Zimbardos, put them in the, in the pan. Delicious. It does, yeah. Mm, is that mm. that? Kind of hungry now. For fish? It bent, it's 10.42. Yeah. <laughs> Eggs Benedict? No. Eggs... What's the one with salmon? Is it royal? So the prisoners state that they weren't aware this was going to happen. Obviously, them being arrested authentically in their own neighbourhood in front of all of their neighbours might not have been the best look. But Zimbardo was very kind of clear in the orientation that this was going to happen and that they knew it was going to happen. So it depends who you believe. But... If they weren't aware, um, then straight away before the experiment has even properly started, this was declared a breach of ethics in Zimbardo's own contract, which each participant had signed. There is video footage of many of these arrests as a local television reporter was conveniently following the police around in Philip Zimbardo's car. 
And whilst all of this was going on, the experiment guards were waiting in the mock prison, which now had a sign attached to the wall and was referred to as Stanford County Jail. From the Palo Alto police station, the blindfolded prisoners were placed back into the back of the police cars with once again their sirens on. Get in the car! <laughs> where they were then transferred to the mock prison, where they would be taken into the custody of the experiment guards. Upon arrival, the guards subjected the prisoners to an incredibly degrading strip search, where they then issued each prisoner with their uniform and unique prisoner number. The uniform was also degrading and uncomfortable. It consisted of a single smock slash short dress, basically looked like a very large t-shirt. Oversized t-shirt is I think the term and they were not allowed to wear any kind of underwear or bottom half of clothing to go with it. They were also given rubber sandals, a nylon stocking hair cap, and had a large steel chain bolt placed around their ankles. The nylon cap itself was apparently used to simulate uh, the experience of them having had their hair shaved off. After this humiliation was over, they were placed into the prison cells where they spent the rest of their first day. And yeah, it was quite an awkward moment. The guards, obviously, this was their first experience of handling the prisoners. They were laughing and joking with them. They kind of knew of each other. So it was all quite friendly, but also then once they forced them to strip, they started berating them, making fun of them uh, and humiliating them. So already the power balance is, is, is uh, in movement here. That's, That's very, very small. small. What are you going to do, do with that? that? <laughs> That's stinging. Yeah, That's mean. That stinks. <laughs> How humiliating. Um, <laughs> according to the official Stanford Prison Experiment website, Each prisoner was systematically searched and stripped naked. He was then deloused with a spray to convey our belief that he may have germs or lice. Real male prisoners don't wear dresses, but real male prisoners do feel humiliated and do feel emasculated. Our goal was to produce similar effects quickly by putting men in a dress without any underclothes. Indeed, as soon as some of our prisoners were put in these uniforms, they began to walk and to sit differently and to hold themselves differently, more like a woman than a man. I have to say, Zimbardo does have, seem to have some weird perversions within all of this. Like, he loves the power, he puts himself at the top of the tree. I don't think it's necessary to do... I, I understand the kind of stripping and the that side of it, because that is a prison-related thing. But prisoners don't walk around <laughs> essentially long boyfriend t-shirts and don't wear any underwear like yeah that part was weird i mean i i i winced at some of the recreations of them uh being strip searched and and deloused but mm. that does happen in prisons but then mm. when they're handed this bizarre uniform and it's a, a chain around one ankle as well just to remind them it's more sort of symbolic than anything physical yeah just to go on that quote that quote earlier as well from Zimbardo where he said we have total power in the situation and they have none it's like we even that makes you feel like we have total power yeah it just feels like is he living out some kind of weird fantasy of you know, being in control of all these young men because I don't know it seems very odd and him saying oh they sat differently is it yes yeah. if you put a man in a kilt he sits differently if he's not wearing <laughs> underneath it's like it's not yeah. like they definitely think they're in prison now so, no, because yeah. it's not relative. It's not, it doesn't make any sense within the experiment. It just seems to be very odd. Definitely. So I mean, so the prisoners have just now been mock arrested, well, quite authentically arrested, but in a mock environment, and now they're placed in within their cells. Probably they were expecting, obviously, to be treated like prisoners, but I don't think they were expecting this. And this is when you first start to see them thinking, what the fuck is going on here? And there is a photo uh, taken of them in their first uh, prison lineup. And it does show a very ranging set of emotions within each prisoner. We'll pop the photo up for you now. But some are laughing and joking. Others won't look at the camera. Some have got their head down. Some look visibly uh, uncomfortable. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a really uh, poignant photo. The rest of the day went by without issue, with the prisoners relaxing in their cells and the guards adjusting to their duties. So yeah, they were all thinking it was nice and easy going from this point onwards, prisoners were sat in their cells. One of the guards described it as appearing like some sort of bizarre summer camp. Zimbardo himself began to worry during the first day that the experiment may become very long and very boring as there was a high potential that nothing at all would happen. And yeah, how, how wrong these concerns would turn out to be. So day two at 2.30 a.m., August 16th, 1971, just two and a half hours into the second day of the experiment, a riot almost breaks out amongst the prisoners and guards of the Stanford Prison Experiment after the first of many counts are attempted to be made. 
This happens when the guards attempt to get the prisoners out of their beds during the early hours by blowing their whistles and banging their batons against the cell doors, and when the prisoners refuse, a heated argument erupts. This results in prisoners remaining within their cells, screaming profanities towards the guards, as well as removing their stitch on prison numbers and nylon stocking caps. The prisoners then barricaded themselves into the cells using their beds. So this is literally a tea the next day, which I feel, yeah. that's bizarre in itself. This was one of the three cells that did this. Um, it was cell number one that did this, and the, the other two cells were kind of reactionary as this was happening, but I think it was because they immediately, the guards immediately, because it was all a bit too friendly for maybe Zimbardo's liking for the first few hours, they tried to turn up the heat a bit. Obviously, the guards were working shifts, so this is when the second set of guards arrive uh, during the night shift. So, yeah, maybe they're just trying to push the buttons a little bit. But, mm. it's uh, yeah, as you said, it's a, a, a very aggressive reaction from the prisoners. So these events left the guards and the researchers equally baffled as the prisoners continued to leave their cells and even to eat or have access to the yard. As well as being confused, the guards also became embarrassed by the situation and wanted to reassert their control. Like we said, the, the, the guards feel this is a big disrespect on them, essentially, and, and probably the experiment as well. And as we said, Zimbala's already said to them, you know, you need to keep control of the people, you need to be realistic. And, you know, we've all seen films where the prison guards are a nightmare to, to the prisoners, so I think this was very much in the back of their heads. This early shot came at a difficult time for the guards, who themselves were given no specific training on how to be guards. Instead, both Dr. Zimbardo and his research assistant David Jaff stated that they were free within limits to do whatever they thought was necessary in order to maintain law and order in the prison and to command the respect of the prisoners. So they put their heads together in the privacy of their adjoining recreation room and came up with a plan. Once you put a uniform on and are given a job to keep these people in line, you really become that person. Once you put on that khaki uniform, you put on the glasses, you take the nightstick, and you act the part. That's your costume, and you have to act the part when you put it on. So yeah, that was Dave Eshelman, who was one of the experiment guards, and the prisoners actually gave him the nickname John Wayne. He, yeah, he will come up uh, regularly in this timeline, but they called him John Wayne because he was very authoritarian, he was very imposing, and he, they also were kind of taking the piss a little bit because they thought he was acting the part and you know playing up to being a guard so they, they were calling him John Wayne and in turn them calling him that actually riled him a bit more to behave even even more darker and even more aggressively to them. John Wayne was a prison warden in the film A Cool Hand Luke which um, yeah Dave actually said he used as inspiration to how he was behaving within this like as we said Zimbardo was saying you know act how you think is is right so Dave actually adorned a, a kind of southern accent as well and he, he's very much playing a role which a lot of people have gone on to criticize saying well that's not a natural way that you would behave in the situation he is playing a role but we'll delve into that a little bit more later on later that day in response to the prisoner protests three of the substitute guards are called to the prison in an attempt for the guards to regain their authority and control so apparently they went back to zimbardo and said look they're doing this they're not coming out what's going on we can't get them to eat we, we can't do anything and he literally just said fix it it's your prison get it under control it's been alleged that Zimbardo hinted call for backup because obviously they were working shifts. So yeah, a, a large team now arrive at the prison. As they arrive, two of the guards make the decision to spray large fire extinguishers directly into the prisoners' cells, making it difficult for them to see or breathe. The guards, together with the additional substitute guards, then removed all of the prisoners from their uniforms, took their mattresses and bedding away from them, before periodically sending who they believed to be the main instigators to the hole. And this was obviously the two foot by two foot storage cupboard that we mentioned. The guards then made threats to the remaining prisoners that this pattern would continue for as long as the experiment lasted if they didn't all start behaving themselves. And this seemed to work on most of the prisoners. Experiment guard Dave Eshelman, or John Wayne, continues. I arrived independently at the conclusion that this experiment must have been put together to prove a point about prisons being a cruel and inhumane place, and, therefore, I would do my part to help those results come about. I was a confrontational and arrogant 18-year-old at the time, and I said, somebody ought to stir things up a bit here. The guards would continue to conduct routine counts on the prisoners from this point onwards all throughout the day and night in order to disrupt their routines and assert their authority over them. So yeah, they'd get them out, they'd line them up and they'd make them call their numbers out from left to right, from right to left, they'd make them sing it, they'd make them shout it, and any slight issue with it, they'd restart the count all over again. 
so yeah, they were putting them through a bit of mental torture there. One of the prisoners they viewed as being the potential ringleader of the rebellion was prisoner number 8612, and this was Douglas Corpy. And so they were especially cruel to him, placing him in the hole for far longer than any other prisoner. Day 3, August 17th, 1971. As tensions seemed to ease for the majority of the prison, the guards continued to assert their dominance once again. This time, they split up the prisoners into two halves, one half who they viewed as having minor roles in the rebellion, and the other half who they viewed to have played a major role. Those having played a minor role were rewarded by being placed in the clean and privileged cells, having their clothing and bedding returned to them, as well as being rewarded with food that was not provided to the rest of the prisoners. And just to kind of, as Ben mentioned earlier, one of the things Sabado said to the prison guards is they can't keep food away from the prisoners. And as we can see here, they've already punishing the prisoners by not giving them the food. Those deemed to have played a major role, however, were made to stay in the damaged cells, which still had remnants of fire extinguishers all over the floor and walls, and did not have any bedding whilst also routinely being taken to the hole. They were not allowed access to food or toilets, being forced to share a metal bucket given to them, the smell of which slowly filled the entire basement. As, ugh. I don't think I could pull on another man's poo. Could you, Dan? You'd rather go first. Oh, yeah, I'd go I've first. Probably, I've probably done it. Oh, festival. Yeah, we all Oh, like. yeah, I've done the festival. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. I don't like doing it. No, I don't think anyone. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I wouldn't be territorial about it. What do you mean territorial? What do you mean by that? Well, if someone pooed, I'd have to poo on top of it. Yeah, that poo's mine now. You can't have that back. <laughs> this is my bucket. <laughs> um, <laughs> just sit later on, he wakes up and just sipping it, going, Why are you looking at <laughs> <that>, fool? <laughs> I gotta get my cuppa. I gotta get my coffee. Yeah. Mm. Cup of brown. But yeah, I wouldn't like it, Ben, but fair play. The guards would also regularly wake them up throughout the night in order to stand on their backs and make these individuals perform naked push ups or other equally humiliating tasks. Jumping jacks would be, or burpees naked wouldn't be fun. Mm. I mean, I find it quite emasculating just doing a burpee fully clothed, but including cleaning the toilets with their bare hands. They'd also randomly swap minor and major prisoners to and from each cell, once again to assert their dominance. Thing is, if you're in the comfy cell and you're still hearing all this going on and the banging and all that stuff, it's not like you're getting a good night's mm. kip. No, and you're definitely smelling it, yeah. Yeah, the smell, Ben. Maybe hearing it. What you, what the, mm. Yeah, big bucket. Yeah, I guess. But yeah, that that is awful. And yeah, they would continually fight. But the thing is, every eight hours, new guards would arrive, fully rested and ready to go. Mm. And they would do a little handover. And this John Wayne and a couple of other ringleaders from each group would say, oh, we did this, we did that. See if you can top that. And so each eight hours, it was getting progressively worse. Quite like being stood on your back, don't you? Yeah, crack my back. Love it. Not while yeah. I'm trying to do push-ups. I don't really do them that often. Mm. But yeah, love a standard walking on my back. Crack everything. But not in that environment. Do you think you'd crack in this environment? My back would still crack. My mentality, state of mind. Day one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I would, not, um, I would not be a fan of being on either team at the moment. I wouldn't be able to do that to people. And I wouldn't like it being done to me. I think you could quickly turn into being a mean guard. No. Yeah, you I'm said I would the, I, the live stream we did the other week, you said I wouldn't be able to be on the traitors because I'm not a Didn't say that. I don't think I said you're not a uh, but I think um, I said yeah, I don't think you would be able to be a traitor no but yeah. that doesn't that's not the in this experiment the whole thing is you're getting coerced into being that you're playing a role exactly. I think you could quick, quickly turn I think that's his whole thing any any person could be under the right set of circumstances I don't know if I agree with that though but that, we'll discuss that later but I think because mm. this is a flawed experiment oh so. absolutely yeah Anyway, back to it. Uh, we mentioned prisoner 8612, Douglas Corpy. Uh, he was one of the participants believed to have been a major role in the kind of, all the trouble, kind of the, the revolt fighting back against the guards. This took an apparently massive toll on his state of mind, and he would become the first individual to lead the experiment just after 36 hours. One of Zimbardo's research assistants, Craig Haney, claimed to observe prisoner 8612 have a mental breakdown, showing signs of an acute emotional disturbance, during which he screamed the following. Oh, screamed. Okay. Jesus Christ, I'm burning up inside! I can't take another night! I just can't take it anymore! Fuck Zimbardo! Fuck you and fuck this simulation! To be fair, it's not bad. It's not bad compared to what... It's kind of close. Should I do a normal one just in case that comes across? <laughs> we could Can actually you... play it. Yeah, it might be quite oh, powerful. Oh, we got it. Good, yeah. it. It is on the yeah, BBC good, doc. Well, Dan could take his clothes off and do it. I'll get the clip. God damn it! You're fucked up! You don't know, you don't know! I mean, God! I mean, Jesus Christ, I'm burning up inside, don't you know? I just fucking can't take it. 
Simbada himself would say that he acted as a prison superintendent in response to this, rather than acting as a psychologist. He offered to personally stop the guards mistreating him if 8612 would act as a snitch on his behalf and return information to him. He was told to sleep on it, but after returning to his cell and informing other prisoners that they won't let me out of here, we are stuck, you can't get out of here, he then made the decision to leave the experiment and was replaced by one of the substitute prisoners. There were also rumours that 8612 was going to return to help the other prisoners escape, which sent a very conflicting message to the remaining prisoners. So one thing to note on this prisoner in particular, I've listened to some podcasts and research that kind of tries to, well, not tries to, it debunks a lot of elements of this whole experiment. People believe that he basically for two weeks, I can just read my books to study for some exams he had after all this. It's like the perfect place I can do it. I'll force myself to read the books and study. Books and everything were taken away from the prisoners. So he was like, what? So I can't do any of this. So they think that he actually did this in order just to get to get out of there because he needed to study for his exams. So, and okay. he, and him acting out and going loot is like he, he himself it's very obvious that i'm putting it on yeah it's just shouting essentially but also so someone having a motive to get out that isn't re relative to the experiment obviously as well muddies the waters in terms of how you know what, how much you can believe and take from this experiment yeah and like, like you said they took everything away from them i think another prisoner got his reading i don't know if they were reading or actual medically required glasses but he had his glasses taken away from him. That's harsh. Another one had vitamins and medication taken away from him. Fucking so, hell. Yeah, it's interesting. But there, yeah, as Tom said, there's loads of other academics and podcasts and, and films to trying to debunk this uh, this uh, experiment. They're taking the piss, literally, in a, yeah. in a silver metal bucket. <laughs> and the shit. Wouldn't it be nice to be an unused substitute prisoner? Do they still get paid? Yeah, I think you pay, you're doing it. Ah. Oh. Thought that you'd get paid just to be on standby, like an uncle. Uncle. <laughs> no, I don't think you would. I might be yeah. wrong. Pay to play. Probably a couple bucks, maybe. Yeah, because that would have been all right. That would have been it for my my preference. Unused prison sub. That says a lot about you. Thank you. So day four, August eighteenth, nineteen seventy one. As a result of the guards segregating those they deemed to be well behaved and those they deemed to be behaving poorly, all of the prisoners began to distance themselves from one another. They were becoming increasingly more paranoid after what happened with 8612 as well. They didn't all know that he'd been allowed to leave. Some people believed he was put in a separate room, which was, you know, solitary confinement. So they weren't completely clear on what happened. Also, when 8612 told them, they won't let us out of here, we can't get out of here. He also told them that he was going to break out of here and come back and allow them to break out with him and escape from the prison. So, yeah, there's a lot of uh, murky elements to 8612. But as a result of all of this happening, the prisoners believed that there were now numerous snitches amongst them. And they also believed that any prisoner misbehaving could cost them their food, their clothing, or their bed. So they slowly and unintentionally became more and more isolated from one another. Late into the fourth day, prisoner 819 began displaying similar signs of distress to those of prisoner 8612. He began crying, with his head in his hands, in the corner of his cell for hours on end. He refused Zimbardo's offer of a visit from a local priest and instead asked to talk to and receive the care of a medical professional. Following this, Zimbardo called prisoner 819 by his real name, confirmed that he would be able to leave and gave him reassurance that this was all purely a simulation. So yeah, I mean, just four days and you're already now completely immersed in that, in that world that is clearly having a toll on his well-being. So in terms of this simulation becoming uh, a world that the prisoners were fully immersed in, they would also have regular parole meetings uh, with Carlo Prescott and Zimbardo and the rest of his uh, associates. And apparently uh, Prescott would be particularly brutal to them and challenge any of them for not being tough enough. And he would take his role far too seriously and become very, very immersed in the role itself. Obviously, he'd spent 17 years himself in San Quentin, so he would view their experiences of the first four days as being, you know, little to nothing in comparison to what he went through. So he was apparently incredibly cruel to the to the prisoners, which again only continued to impact their belief that they were in a real prison and not able to leave uh, the experiment. Adding panic and confusion to the situation, as prisoner 819 was being removed from the experiment, the guards surrounded the remaining prisoners and forced them to loudly begin repeatedly chanting, prisoner 819 did a bad thing. And yeah, there's there's video footage of this which we'll play for you now. And it is, yeah, it is, it's an awkward watch. It's, it's It makes you very uncomfortable. Prisoner 819 did a bad thing. Prisoner 819 did a bad thing. Prisoner 819 did a bad thing. 
Prisoner 819 did a bad thing. As soon as I realized that 819 could hear this, I rushed to the room where I had left him. And what I found was a boy crying hysterically, while in the background his fellow prisoners were chanting and yelling that he is a bad prisoner and that they were being punished because of him. See, Dr. Zimbardo would actually recall um, talking to prisoner 819, you know, just when he's about to leave, when I was speaking to him, and then they could hear the chanting happening in the, in the room behind them. And prisoner 819, with tears in his eyes, basically said, I need to go back and prove that I'm not a bad prisoner. So he's been given the option to leave the situation, which is obviously having caused him distress, but the pressure of not appearing to be, I don't know, it's, it's very peculiar. I don't know if it's a case of him maybe thinking they're going to be punished on the behalf of how he's been, but yeah. I'm not sure. It's, it, it, was, it was peculiar. So day five, August 19th, 1971, uh, which was due to be the first of a planned two days where prisoners would be allowed short visits from family members to continue the simulation of a prison environment and schedule. Due to the so far challenging and highly volatile experiences of the experiment, Zimbardo initially wondered whether or not to let this go ahead at all. Eventually, he decided that it would be good for the well-being and morale for the remaining prisoners, so the planned visits would go ahead, but not without some form of mediation. Zimbardo and his guards made family members wait for multiple hours in order to spend between five to 10 minutes with their loved one. Only two family members were allowed to meet with a prisoner and it would be under the direct view of a guard standing next to them. Does that happen in normal prisons? They kind of in, in and about them, aren't they? I mean, yeah, just everything there, waiting, making them wait. I guess I've, well, I've seen it in films where they make people wait, but five to 10 minutes. I don't know if, I don't, I don't know. I wish I was more knowledgeful. Knowledgeful, you should. See you later. That should have been one of the cases this week. Yeah. Cokey, knowledgeful. Fucking hell. So a large portion of the family members were shocked by their son's, husband's, or brother's appearance and mental state, and many of them left the visit with the intention of contacting lawyers and the real police in order to obtain the loved ones for early release from the experiment. To make matters worse for Zimbardo, during the evening of the fifth day, fellow psychologists and other researchers were invited to view the experiment. When they entered the mock prison, they could not believe what they were seeing before them probably smelling as well, I imagine. Guards were continually verbally abusing the heavily malnourished prisoners, many of whom were blindfolded or had bags over their heads or sitting close to their own feces. When questioned about the prison conditions and his lack of empathy towards the prisoners, Zimbardo struggled to answer and found himself almost fully immersed in the superintendent role. He could not provide his colleagues with any kind of answer when questioned about the independent variable of his research. Following on from these subsequent visits, Zimbardo was heavily encouraged to shut down the experiment. So one of those people was in fact Zimbardo's partner at the time and, and is still to this day. She was kind of appalled by what was going on, thinking how cruel, like you're, you're causing these young men to be cruel to one another. They're doing these bad behaviors to one another because of you. Not kind of seeing probably Zimbardo's, you know, vision about the reason for doing this. But um, I think that really told on him and made him kind of question it himself as well. Yeah, he really, really, and the rest of his team bought into the roles that they were playing. He would also wear the same silver sunglasses as the rest of his guards. And it was, he, if anything got out of hand, he would occasionally walk down to the prison himself as well. So it was, yeah, he was very, very immersed in his role itself. Day 6, August 20th, 1971. Due to the objections that we mentioned, as well as the increased levels of brutality demonstrated by the guards, as well as the numerous family members that were now seeking legal advice for the situation, Zimbardo made the decision to end the Stanford prison experiment. That morning, he called together all of the prisoners and guards, as well as his research assistants, to let them know that the experiment was officially over. So outside of the prison, Zimbardo pulled everybody together for a debrief to share their personal experiences. First of all, he spent a couple of hours with the prisoners before spending under an hour with the guards. He then pulled both groups together for a joint meeting. So all of these individuals at this point were quite shocked that it was very abruptly uh, ended. Prisoners were very, very disorientated going from being under the control of the guards to then sharing a table and feedback with them. He also informed all uh, participants that he would pay them for six days and allow them to leave the basement. He encouraged all of them to return in one week's time to share their opinions and emotions. It was a prison to me. It still is a prison to me. I don't look on it as an experiment or a simulation. It was just a prison that was run by psychologists instead of run by the state. I began to feel that the identity, the person that I was that had decided to go to prison, was distant from me, was remote, until finally I wasn't that. I was 416. I was really my number. And 416 was going to have to decide what to do. 
So that was Clay Ramsey, who obviously, as Dan said, was prisoner number 416. The experiences he had in the six days really stayed with him for a great deal of time. He struggled to adjust when they pulled the groups together for their shared feedback and shared emotions. He he struggled to look the people that played the guards in the eyes, and it had a big impact on him for, for the months that would follow. The following day, the prison dubbed Stamford County Jail was taken down, thoroughly cleaned and restored to its former basement condition. Zimbardo and his team would then return to their offices to analyse their data and recordings obtained from the experiment, which would later go on to form part of Zimbardo's Lucifer Effect theory. Many of his critics claimed that the experiment was unethical and broke several basic human rights. Many also claimed that Zimbardo and his team encouraged and regularly turned a blind eye to the guards' brutality. Dr. Zimbardo concluded the experiment's abrupt finish by making the following statement. The experiment forced us to confront the fragile nature of our own humanity. The participants became trapped in their respective roles, unable to break free from the psychological boundaries they had created. The study showed how easily people can slip into abusive positions and justify their actions. It was a stark reminder that we must be constantly vigilant against the abuse of power. Apparently as well, the final thing that really forced Zimbardo to, to conclude and abruptly finish the experiment was that David Eshelman, obviously the guard nicknamed John Wayne, was really getting, uh, again, like the rest of them, immersed into the world of his role. And apparently he instructed the prisoners to begin to simulate sodomy on one another. And this was observed by Zimbardo and his team. And that was when they decided, right, this has to end. Because uh, apparently it got to that level and he was, yeah, horrific. I saw a clip from that where makes one of them pretend to be Frankenstein and tell another prisoner he loved them. Yeah. Which was incredibly peculiar. We're going to go into a bit of aftermath now, but that essentially is the experiment. But yeah, we're going to discuss a little bit further now and then a little bit of the aftermath. Zimbardo did not face any legal consequences due to the prisoners agreeing to take part, obviously with him signing the contracts, though he does have his critics. Dr. Philip Zimbardo has been described as one of the most distinguished living psychologists, having served as a president of the American Psychological Association, with his areas of focus including time perspective, Shyness, which is terrorism, madness, and evil. Shyness just dropped in there. Maybe a shy, mad terrorist is his dream person to speak to. I don't don't know. Um, He also created and narrated an award winning 26 part, that's a lot of parts, part CBS series, a small part of Frankenstein, called Discovering (laughs) Psychology. He has published more than 50 books as well as more than 400 professional articles. At the time of recording, Zimbardo is coming up to his 91st birthday. He lives in San Francisco and is still active within the academic community. He is a prof... Oh, fuck, I heard this said and I know I'm going to... Professor Emeritus. 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 Yeah. Wow. I would never have guessed. Mm. Fuck me, man. Cum laude. Bukaki. Oh, Come hear that again now. Laude. He is a professor emeritus at Stanford University, where he taught for more than 50 years, starting in 1968. He continues to conduct research at Stanford and to teach at Palo Alto University in California. Today, he continues to work as the director of an organization he founded called the Heroic Imagination Project. Uh, He's a modest company, isn't he? <laughs> Heroic Imagination Project. Come on, Zimbardo. <laughs> The company promotes research, education, and media initiatives designed to inspire ordinary people to act as heroes and agents of social change. Like he inspired John Wayne in the uh, experiment to make people pretend to sodomise each other. (laughs) Yes. In August of 2022, Dr. Zimbardo released his memoir, Zimbardo, My Life Revealed. It has two five-star reviews on Amazon right now, with the blurb stating, From explaining how good people can do bad things and how ordinary people can become heroes, Zimbardo provides an insider's perspective of his research that has impacted our understanding of each other and the world around us. He also, uh, as I said at the start of the episode, he also has a Twitter page or an X page where as recently as February of 2023, he has criticised and critiqued podcasts that cover the Stanford prison experiment. Please, uh, I wonder what he thinks of ours. I'd love it. With Zimbardo and his colleague Craig Haney stating that podcast hosts had no right to comment on a kind of expose pieces of the experiment due to the fact that they knew nothing about prisons, uh, which I, fair enough, had never been inside one, fair enough, had never visited one, and had never conducted their own psychological experiment. I mean, I'm kind of my own little walking, talking psychological experiment for you guys. 
Don't you do a lot of it on yourself, to be fair. Cheers. The pair claimed that the podcast had, quote, ignored what we have repeatedly said the study itself means, that good, normal people can be led to do extremely bad things when they are manipulated and overcome by powerful institutional or structural forces. It is these dehumanising and cruel settings and the perverse psychological dynamics they generate that are often rotten to the core, not otherwise decent people whose behaviour is transformed by them, rather than their headline-grabbing straw man. So yeah, hopefully we haven't done anything in this episode to upset the doctor. Absolutely fine to upset the doctor, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, as I said, like, he's made this experiment. He's fucked it by not doing the independent variable thing to show what would happen if you didn't, if they weren't kind of coerced to act in a certain way. He's made them wear essentially skimpy little outfits without any underwear, which is completely unnecessary. You know, he obviously must have witnessed food being taken away from them and also then being made of shit in buckets and whatnot and thought, that's fine, we'll let that carry on. He's supposed to be you know overseeing all this he could easily have had a word with the people saying you know come on this isn't this is going too far but he was more than happy to let it kind of roll on and i think he's might have done it for different reasons like for actual legit reasons at the beginning but i think he got lost in his role wearing sunglasses and all that bollocks and just didn't yeah. really yeah. see it through what he what he wanted it to be and now he's just trying to protect his name by becoming so immersed in that role he's encouraged his guards and turned a blind eye to all of the horrific things that, that he's he's finding where I assume a more mainstream superintendent would step in or prevent that or at least a warden would and I think that has influenced what he's wanting to find with this experiment and there's no proper controls to, to make prevent that uh, yeah very flawed study so as well as the Sanford prison experiment, Dr. Zimbardo is well known for the Lucifer effect, the time cure shyness, social intensity syndrome, and the time paradox. He was also called as an expert witness at the Abu Ghraib trials, presumably due to his involvement in the Stanford prison experiment, with Abu Ghraib subsequently being dubbed the real-life Stanford prison experiment. As we mentioned, the Sanford experiment ended after just six days, with the Abu Ghraib one ended after at least two months, with some speculating it's to go on a lot longer than that. So, yeah, he's well known for, obviously, as Tom mentioned, the time paradox as well as uh, the Lucifer effect. And in the Lucifer effect, a good example of that theory is how television character Walter White goes from a seemingly uh, good person and transforms into this dark, dark drug baron. So, yeah, he's, he's deemed as one of the most prominent examples of the Lucifer effect. Also links back to the Salem witch trials as well, when the community, the whole community could turn on one of their own person um, based on religious fanaticism and collective hysteria. Uh, Zimbardo has done a, a whole bunch of TED Talks um, that are all available on YouTube. Lots of interviews um, uh, on YouTube as well. He's very prominent. And as we mentioned throughout the timeline, it's also been um, compared to Nazi party methodology. There's another experiment as well, similar results to the Stanford Prison Experiment, which was the 1967 Third Wave Experiment. The first film version based on or inspired by the Stanford Prison Experiment was the 1977 Italian film La Gabbia, uh, which literally means the cage. And in 2001, a German film of the events followed, and that was called, uh, hopefully I've got this right, Dan, Das Experiment. Um, Spot on. I think you're close. Yeah, I think you're close, man. Thanks so much which was followed up by a 2010 American remake called The Experiment, starring Adrian Brody as one of the prisoners and Forrest Whitaker as one of the guards. I remember seeing it ages ago. Uh, I watched it with my dad and it was pretty good. Most recently in 2015, the Stanford Prison Experiment uh, was released and it won a couple of awards at Sundance and it stars Ezra Miller as Prisoner 8612 and Billy Crudup as Dr. Zimbardo. I watched it yesterday. Um, it's de I would recommend both films, The Experiment and uh, The Stanford Prison Experiment. They explore more of Zimbardo becoming becoming the superintendent and the how puppet master yeah it's i would highly recommend both films i know we usually slate films based on cases we've covered but both of those two i thought were really really good i heard they're quite dramatizing involving violence and stuff that didn't actually happen there was a couple things they've changed but it's not i wouldn't say it was massively changed there's a yeah there's a couple of them are hit with batons which obviously didn't happen but i don't think they'd lean on it too much really uh so i would recommend them and the experiment movie makes reference to the popular Bob Dylan song, George Jackson, uh, which is about a black man who had encountered a great deal of racial prejudice from white inmates and guards within US prison systems. The song itself was written in tribute to Black Panther leader George Jackson, who had been shot and killed by guards at San Quentin prison during an attempted escape. 
The event indirectly provoked the Attica prison riot. And uh, yeah, the lyrics, which quite well sum up this case, sometimes this whole world is just one big prison yard. Some of us are prisoners, the rest are guards. Nob Dylan. Have some respect to Bob Dylan. Yeah. And as I mentioned, there's also the official Stanford Prison Experiment uh, website. It's quite biased in their own narrative and what they were hoping to do, but I mean, it's a .org as well. So I'm assuming that that is run and maintained by some kind of funding from maybe Zimbardo himself or one of his, I don't know, one of his associates. But it's uh, it's interesting because it contains their version of events, but also lots of archived uh, photos and videos. So we'll pop that in our Facebook group, which is uh, which is popping off at the moment, Tom. Oh, popping every second, mate. Don't you worry about that. But yes, that is the case of the Stanford prison experiment. Let us know what you guys think. Do you think it was a flawed experiment? Do you think it does show people uh, can be innately turned into evil people by just um, merely being in a situation? Or do you think it was very much biased and flawed from the start? Dan, do you have any kind of initial feelings about it? I mean, ultimately, very interesting from a human perspective, but it was flawed. Mm. Uh, I'm interested to hear about what role you think I would take and how (laughs) I would uh, end up. If it was set up as it was and Mm. you were told, you know, you've got to keep them in line to keep the the experiment legitimate, Mm. I think you would go for, I think all day you'd go for prison guard anyway. Um, I think you would. All day. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Is that you agreeing? Yes. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, I think, yeah, you'd go for that. And I think if it was set up like that way, then yeah, you would happily enforce it. Maybe not to the, well, I'd like to think not to the extremes of uh, <laughs> trying to make people uh, fake sodomy on one another. But who knows? Naked press ups, um, shit in a bucket, wouldn't put it past you. But then I, I also think if it was done properly, you wouldn't get that set. You'd be firm, but firm but fair, Dan. Perhaps if I was a bit younger, you know, like early 20s, I might have kind of gone down that road quite easy. Mm. But nowadays, mm. uh, firm but fair. Yeah, I, yeah. 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 I think if I was one of Dan's prisoners, I wouldn't take the piss. I would know. <laughs> All right, mate. I'll, um, my bed's made. I'm not going to cause any trouble here. Uh, see you later. You want to say see you later? You've got nowhere to go. Well, yeah. But you see, he can, I'll see you later when you come back. If you want to come back. What would you boys choose? Guard or prisoner? Probably guard, to be fair. Mm. Before, yeah. before the experiment, prisoner. But then, again, this is part, did they know they were going to, well, I assume they knew they'd have to stay in there 24-7, and the, did, would they have known that the guards were, would, would work in shifts, though? Because that would be nothing. Yeah. You'd be a good prisoner, Ben, I think. Thank, thank you. for. I think that's a compliment, isn't it? <laughs> no. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I probably, yeah, probably would. Yeah, I don't think you'd be a troublemaker. I think you'd do as you're yeah. told. Yeah. Cheers. Again, I'm not sure if that's a compliment. No, it's not really. <laughs> no. no spirit. But um, you and me. Well, we we'll talked about this. But yeah, it's <laughs> easily um, moldable, um, manipulated, and um, lack of will. But anyway, that's yeah. the case of the stuff. Good on a CV. Exper- easily moldable. Are you, oh, you looking for a job? Yeah. No, 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 no. But yes, that is the case of the Stanford Prison Experiment. We hope you guys found it as interesting as we did. Don't forget, if you are, you know, desperate for more cases, we do have over 150 over on our website, icmap.co.uk, with a few different tiers you can go over there, different prices for different um, different privileges, uh, oh, like privileges of a nice cell for the night. So it's basically the same setup as this visually, so why not go over there and check it out? Yeah, and if you found if you found this one uh, harrowing, wait until you hear our Holmesburg prison experiment episode because goodness me, oh, acres of skin. Yeah, that was mentioned. Yes, disgusting. Mm. Yeah. And also, if you're interested, we are going to be at CrimeCon this year, uh, so be sure to check that out. We posted it over on our socials, but why not head over there? You can use our discount code ICMAP for ten percent off the tickets, and we'd love to see you there. Yeah, we'd absolutely love to see you there. We'd love to meet people in person. As well as that, all of the socials, we're pretty much at Could Murder a Pod, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. As, as we mentioned, we've now got a Facebook group as well where people kind of share lots of things they find fascinating, news articles. It's uh, it's, it's popping off. And uh, obviously for each episode we cover, we're, we're sharing extra bits of detail there. So the, the interactive uh, Ted Bundy map and now also the uh, <laughs> the official Stanford Prison Experiment website. And also something exciting, we have dropped some new merch over at the merch store, so be sure to check it out. It's part of our sunny side up range, the diner range. Why not go over there and have a little looky? And why not why not treat yourself, eh? Eh? Anyway, like we always say, Ben. Well, hang on, my cryptic clue. 
Oh, sorry about that. Let's Ooh, not breathe yeah. past that. Uh, oh, is that in the bucket? Surrounded by pissing? Yeah, go on. It is, yeah. So, Benjamin Carter's cryptic clues. Everyone gather around for some cr- clues that can be quite cryptic, but he's going to b- give them to you anyway. Hope you can figure them out. Obviously, we've had the uh, the Chelsea one for this week's uh, episode. For next week, I think this one is not going to piss people off as much. Okay, next week's episode. Batman wouldn't want to stumble into that home. No way. Batman wouldn't want to stumble into that home. No way. Yeah, it's not It's not a cryptic clue, because every cryptic clue has to have specific things that mean everything. Yeah, it's, cryptic, it. right? it's kind of cryptic, because of the stuff in there. But Dan made me a nice fitting jingle. <laughs> I did, yeah. yeah. yeah it was... It's like <laughs> Rockbusters, Carl Pilkington cryptic clues. Yeah, yeah. You have to kind of mix words up a little bit to make it work and mispronounce things a little bit. Yeah. But anyway, like guys, thanks so much <laughs> for joining us. We, we look forward to being back next week for a new case. And like we always say, we say this all the time. Keep on doing what you're doing. Well, unless it's uh, cum laude. Cum laude. Unless it's, yeah. In in the yeah, and those police sirens ruining your Sunday summer morning uh, in the hot summer sun. Um, you know, unless it's doing experiments that may be flawed. I mean, but don't you have to do loads of flawed experiments to Shut get up! the right? <laughs> See you next week. I'm so happy about that. Thank you so much. I've been Ben. He's been Dan. And that's been Tom. Bye. Bye.